podcast for What My Name Is Sam, and as ever, I'm I'm joined by... Hello. Hello, Alex. Alex. How's it going? Yeah, good, good, good. Very good. We are today talking about the policing bill um, that is going through the House of Commons as we speak. At the time of recording, it's it's not been voted through, but by the time of release, it might have been voted through, so we're going to keep things ambiguous and, you know... Yeah, it's very likely to be voted through, as, we, as we'll discuss uh, in the episode. Just a quick content note, uh, in addition to all the various kind of content notes that uh, apply to all our episodes that are about the far right, um, this also contains discussion of sexual violence and of um, state violence. Fascism, as in like actual fascism, requires the coordination of two different things. Um, and we focus very much on the kind of the far right parties. But... It also requires the accretion of authoritarian instruments by conservative states, essentially. And that, that slow accretion, as they kind of gather more and more, and more powers, um, allows then far-right uh, groups or fascist groups to like come in and like take over the state that is already authoritarian in form uh, and then um, kind of accelerate beyond that. And so although on this podcast we focus very much on the far-right groups who have their... Um, the politics will kind of push for more authoritarian politics from the state often, although there's more kind of complicated things going on than that. Um, we haven't really focused on the expanding powers of the police state, essentially, or the, 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 the state, uh, the state's policing capabilities. And we need to do that as well. And this is a really major um, escalation in the process that's been going on for quite some time, which is the expansion of the, the legal powers of the state to um, essentially uh, uh, um, discipline the population. What what is the historic? Is there any hist- history to this? Like contention that the cons- like a cons- like an accretion of conservative authoritarian state powers is happens in conjunction with, uh, or is necessary for even a, a seizure of fascist a fascist seizure of power. Michael Mann is a sociologist who does a kind of a comparative analysis of all different kinds of fascist movements across Europe. Things that were successful, ones that were unsuccessful uh, in the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties. And essentially the question he's trying to answer is why was it that although there were fascist movements and often quite large ones in all different kinds of states, um, there were really only a few that were successful. Um, so why is it that those ones were successful and the other ones weren't? And one of the answers he comes up with is, or one of the kind of parts of the answer he comes up with is that there is a kind of um, different categories of authoritarianism in that period and he has four levels of this uh, the first one is kind of semi-authoritarian states and he into this he actually interestingly puts um the pre-fascist regime of von papen and this kind of um the, the german regime at that time and then there are kind of fully authoritarian states which uh essentially use um the powers of the, the police in a much more kind of robust way um or like i say robust it's obviously a euphemism um in a much more intensely violent way to crush the left and the third level, this is what he calls corporatism, which is essentially that the entirety of the social whole is, is managed by um, the state, uh, and managed by um, uh, yeah the state, um, including unions and so on and so on. Right. So, like the kind of what is the oppositional element within society, or what has been what is opposed to the um, capitalist process, or at least tries to have a voice for the workers inside the capitalist process, is subsumed within the state and managed as a part of the kind of the life of the nation, etc. And then, of course, the fourth level is fascism itself, um, in which you know the secret police become like a vastly more important and much more powerful um, kind of uh, institution, essentially producing a parallel state to the state itself. So, um, one of the kind of most famous processes that happens during the Nazi period is that the SS uh, becomes a kind of like a second state that is more or less directly under Hitler's command, whereas there's there's the existing German state that is much less um, kind of dominated by Hitler, although it has to people have to swear fealty to him and so on and obviously the nazis are to some extent also in command of that one i mean very much in command of that one but not within in the kind of unswervingly loyal manner that the the kind of parallel ss state was and so you essentially get these these four different layers obviously the current uk is not in the fourth one <laughs> it's also obvious as well that it's not in the third one it's not a corporatist state um there is still opposition within society although the the capacity of groups to oppose um, the the functioning of the state uh, is increasingly being eroded, and that that is an incredibly important, um, incredibly important development. I also don't think that it's in the kind of the second form of authoritarianism, um, but I think it's quickly becoming. And this is you know I don't think overly um, histrionic or overly kind of like um, exaggerated to say that the UK is very fast becoming a kind of semi-authoritarian state um, in which. Uh, 
the powers of protest are, um, or the powers of kind of activity within society are effectively curtailed um, in favour of, of state power. Um, you are looking very sceptical about this, Alex. Uh, Scepticise. I think this uh, police crime and sentencing and courts bill, it's a real danger and um, it's going to pass. And we starting to start thinking, I'm not sure whether we're in a position to describe the, um, you know, the, the UK state as any more authoritarian than it's been for the last 30 years or whatever. Like there is a, there's clearly been a shift um, since a, a, a kind of before time in which, you know, protests and sent are more actively managed. I think that, period started to come in around reclaim the streets um the 90s movement to anti-roads movement um where you saw much more uh, a clearer management of protest although you know you can you can trace it further back to the miners uh the miners uh, strike and you know further back than that i mean i mean ultimately the the uh, the important thing here is that the uk is um has always has for a very long time uh been a, a colonial state, right? That has um, used paramilitary force um, and used uh, the military force uh, around the globe to enforce its its will, um, including in territories that are kind of ambiguous. Um, so, for example, obviously there is still contention over the, the question of the status of um, Northern Ireland, uh, and so the the the, um, the relation between um, policing on what is called the mainland, right, the kind of the Great Britain as an island, and the policing in Ireland it is, in some sense, like the um, is kind of an important part of the, the, the dynamic of British policing, in which there are um, tactics that are used on in Ireland um, that are then kind of uh, to varying degrees kept away from the mainland. Um, the most kind of obvious example of this, or kind of a really like clear example of this, is um, the use of water cannons, right? So um, um, this is, of course, directly relevant to the present situation because the situation, because in the in 2000, I think it was um, 12, 2010, maybe, uh, to, to, in, I can't remember the exact date, um, Boris Johnson, who was then the mayor of London, proposes buying, and he does buy, um, three uh, water cannons um, at kind of bargain basement prices <laughs> um, for the use on, on the mainland. But, and this is, of course, taken, uh, rightly so, as an extreme violation of the right to protest, uh, because in the, in the words of, um, I think, the, the, the police's own assessment of their utility, they're indiscriminate instruments. But what's important here is that this is not the first time that the UK government as a whole has had access to water cannons, right? There are six water cannons already existing in Northern Ireland. So there's this kind of dynamic between um, the policing in Ireland and uh, the policing on the mainland. I think it's really crucial to grasp the question of how uh, the UK is policed and how dissent is managed. I, I mean, I would say that if you want to look at like a, like an example that you know, the British state full full bore, then the north of Ireland is a is a, an example. But obviously there are other examples as well. Like you, like you said, you can't talk about British policing without talking about British colonialism ultimately and the kind of management of crowds and, and things like this, which is ultimately what this comes down to. The, this, the police crim, crime, the police crime sentencing court bill, <laughs> the new bill is, you know, a response to mass protests. So it's, it's a response to Extinction Rebellion, particularly and Black Lives Matter and, the you know the the Home Secretary and the the Metro, and Cressida Dick the, the head of the Metropolitan Police have been talking about this for like you know since the XR protests uh, there was you know moves uh, a while ago now to declare XR a kind of criminal organisation for the demonstrations they did and I think they, particularly after the 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 blockade of of news, news corp printing presses or offices. Obviously, th they decided that wasn't the right route to go, and obviously, it would have been al extremely alarming to declare a bunch of, you know, uh, to dis to declare XR to be a serial serious criminal organisation. And this is what they brought in in response. And it, it's acknowledged there's a Tory MP who's quoted in the Guardian saying, um, you know, XR were extremely disruptive, and therefore we need this bill. Now, the, also the the thing that also confuses the issue about the bill is that it's uh, an omnibus bill. It's got a bunch of stuff in there, harsher sentences for child killers, harsher sentences for, you know, a whole bunch of different crimes, and an increase in the in sentence for assault on an emergency worker, uh, restrictions on new crimes against uh, um, unlawful and uh, unlawful encampments, which is particularly targeted against uh, GRT communities, they're 
um, Gypsy Roma Traveller communities and obviously is aimed at XR as well and these kind of protest fracking camps that you know have been constant thorn in the in the side of fracking companies for years now and so it's hard it's it's it's, it's there's a need to pass this as well um uh, and we want to be focused particularly on how this relates to anti-fascism because a, a bunch of anti-fascist activity is is related to street protest and Looking at the actual changes, these are like significant encroachments on the right to protest and the right to assemble. Um, but as they relate to anti-fascist protests, I'm not sure they, they do have they have they have relevance. They increase the police's power, but also they're they're aimed at a different. They're not aimed. They were originally aimed at anti-fascism. But we also have to um, distinguish when we're talking about these things between the law itself and the application of the law in practice, which are two different things. And of course, the police often overstep the kind of legal boundaries of, uh, of you know, their, their legal boundaries and conditions um, in order to achieve their own aims or to have, uh, with other considerations in mind, whether that's to intimidate protests, to discourage it, to punish. Um, so we can't obviously record this episode without acknowledging the attack, the police attack on the big deal for Sarah Everard that happened on Saturday. And... Um, how, and we don't know the reasons why that happened. Uh, I personally think that it was a punishment for not going along with the kind of discouragement of the official uh, official vigil organisers. Um, but, um, and it, that does seem to have been an overstep by the police, a miscalculation, because obviously a kind of an intervention like that is not like, doesn't happen. The police is a, like a very hierarchical organisation. Um, decisions are made uh, by commanders, not by sergeants or constables. And so this this was decided by probably not even in a, the, the commander in charge of the operation, but someone higher up probably that this this kind of intervention. And I mean the justification the police made for this, the COVID regulations and the COVID safety is a patently ridiculous of, as well. Like the reason. Um, if they had gone along with the kind of social distance vigil, then there wouldn't have been there wouldn't have been the kind of crowd that we saw. If they hadn't have waded in and started beating people up and crowding people, crushing people, then there would be even less reason. There would be even less, you know, reason for um, reason for these kind of interventions. Um, so we just need to acknowledge that as we as we we go on that talk about this, that a lot of the, that kind of that kind of police action is made more likely by the this new law it's a signal as it were to police forces across the country that there is a new kind of ethos in how protest and dissent is policed um so th yeah like i said those two different factors that we have to keep in mind at all times when it yeah, I, think, I think i think we're saying about it being an omnibus bill is is important because the opposition from labor has mostly been focused on the question of whether or not um, or was focused until I think yesterday, possibly the day before, when Labour changed their position to be against the bill um, before uh, uh, the over the over policing or the kind of the attack on uh, the vigil on, on, on Saturday. Uh, Labour, I think, were planning to abstain from the vote or possibly even uh, vote for it. I can't remember. Um, but now they are voting against it, and their opposition before that point was mostly um, in terms of their uh, the question of whether or not it kind of. Um, Put victims first, right? In various kinds, of, and as you say, like it, it's it's also targeted against um, kind of high penalties for uh, child killers and, and, and so on. Um, let's be more precise about what exactly the bill um, allows for. So there are some specific conditions that are really relevant to anti-fascists, um, and these relate to the kind of conditions on protests themselves. Um, so what the situation we've got at the moment is, you do not have to notify the police whether you are going to, if you are organising a static protest, one that is not intending to move. But you do legally have to notify them if you're organising a protest that will march, is a procession. Um, what the, this bill will do is expand that legal notificate, legal obligation to notify the police to static marches, which you know is a is a, a, a massive uh, encroachment. Um, and another. Um, condition is that there'll be less requirement for police to impose conditions in the first place and it'll be broadened out to be 
uh, if a protest is disturbing to communities and organisations, in a much and that's kind of broaden the scope of when conditions are allowed to be imposed. And the the, the bill specifically um, allows for disturbances to business as well, which is you know another massive overreach. Um, a lot of protest is targeted towards particular big businesses, Shell, you know, BA Systems um, facilitating genocide in in Yemen. These kind of things. If a protest was to disturb the, or the operation of that business, then conditions could be imposed. Which this is like this is quite serious. Um, the 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 other one that I really want to draw attention to, and I'm I'm going off the um, the Commons Library briefing from the 12th of March 2021. So the House of Commons have a, a the House of Commons Library is like an impartial, politically impartial service. It does research and lays out the implications of laws and what the changes are and things like that for MPs mainly, uh, exclusively for MPs. Um, but they publish their findings um, on, on their website. Um, the, this other condition is, oh, so firstly, there's a, there's a, there's a condition on one person protests. And usually a, a pro it counts as a protest if there's two, mo two or more people. Um, that's less uh, relevant to anti-fascism. If you're doing anti-fascism as one person, you're uh, in trouble. <laughs> so there are certain conditions you can impose on processions and static demonstrations. And these are, are called Section 12 and Section 14 of the Public Order Act. And they're basically police conditions about when, when you can assemble, when you can march, where you can march what the official route can be. And if you veer off that route, then you're in breach of those conditions if they are imposed. Now, one of the biggest changes and the one that has, you know, the thing that will be most affect anti-fascists is uh, a change in the um, offence of breaking these conditions. So as it stands now, the police, you have to know about the conditions in order to breach them. So you have to act the the prosecution if you are taking a trial for the for a breach of these conditions, have to actively prove that you are uh, you knew about uh, the conditions, which is obviously quite hard to do to provide you know independent proof that someone knows something in their head. Um, often that involves there's, there's there's certain ways that the police have tried to make people aware of the conditions, so they announce them on loud hailers or they give out leaflets with conditions written on them. And this is pretty effective. So, what effective ways of blocking these are to sing. Uh, or to uh, simply not take the leaflet. Those are um, two effective uh, legal defences. And it, this makes it really hard to get... Um, I mean, this, is, this has been often used by antifascists, and the, the change has been uh, a change from protesters needing to know actively about a breach to a one to language works they have... Uh, it says they have ought to have known. So there's a, so it changes from actually knowing to you should have, you should have known, so therefore you were in breach. And so... A bunch of these kind of really rather cutesy tactics, you know, shouting over the loud hailer, not accepting leaflets, denying blind about um, knowing any anything about conditions has been taken away. And, and this, is, this doesn't affect anti-fascists, this affects a bunch of different protests and it's going to result, likely, in a bunch more convictions. Now, these are not serious convictions. They're summary-only offences, very unlikely to go to prison unless there's You've got a long criminal history, or there's aggregating, fa aggregating factors, but it's still a criminal offence, and you will much be much more likely to be convicted of it if you are in breach. Um, so that's another um, uh, quite uh, that's a massive change, and something anti-fascists need to be aware of. Um, the bill is most obviously draconian in in two ways. One. Uh, the Section 12 and 14 conditions I mentioned before um, have been expanded. So previously, uh, police could uh, give conditions according to the time of the demonstration, where it was taking place, and the amount of people attending the demonstration. And now that has been changed in the bill to uh, conditions which the police, any conditions which the police deem appropriate, which is obviously a massive expansion of the of police's power over protesters and how th they can dictate how protests go. The other one is just obviously in sentencing. Um, there's this new 10-year term uh, for protests that cause serious, serious annoyance or serious disturbance. And obviously maximum sentences are very rarely given and considering the state of the, the overcrowding of prison systems are likely really like years-long sentences would be quite rare. But the, precedent, the maximum sentence gives a guidance on like an average sentence. And so 
you know, we expect to see longer sentences from organising uh, what are deemed to be illegal or condition breaching uh, protests. Um, very, very disturbing. Well, there's another thing that I suppose civil libertarians have been, you know, really aware of since the COVID regulations been brought in. Um, and not in like a denying the pandemic uh, kind of way, like anti-mask kind of way, but like, you know, the, the, the restrictions that have been brought in by the state to, uh, for, for reasons of keeping people safe from the virus and stopping spread and stuff like that. The £10,000 fines for organisers of gatherings and things like this. That they are that these kind of regulations are continued after the pandemic is over, and we have to we have to see this bill in that light as well. Like this is not just a response to XR; it's a re, it's like kind of capitalizing on the imposition these imposition of these quite authoritarian uh, restrictions on assembly in order to. Uh, to continue them forward because they're useful to the police. You know, they, they get to enforce them kind of at their own discretion um, at the moment. And that gives them a great amount of leeway and power um, kind of unchecked. You know, these fixed penalty notices are not up for review necessarily, unless you kind of contest them in a court of law, you have to pay them or get taken to court. And so this is what, this is what the, this is what also what the bill is doing um, ultimately. Now, like I said, what we said just before, the bill is going to pass. Like, there's got not going to be enough Tory um, abstentions to, you know, defeat it. And so, as anti-fascists, we need to start thinking about how we are going to, um, you know, what we, how protest is going to look going forward, and how we're going to fight against these uh, protest restrictions as well. I don't remember ever um, informing the police of anything uh, in in the in the beforehand of any protest. Um, this is a pretty common tactic. Um, what are the penalties for carrying on doing that uh, under the new legislation, or does it depend on the question of whether or not it will be seriously disruptive? Uh, it might indicate, and it, we still already see this dynamic, dynamic playing out, just specifically with anti-fascists. Is so that we have often we have certain anti-fascist groups and certain you know self-appointed community leaders um who kind of liaise with the police have an official demonstration agree conditions and then you have like a alternate alternate kind of more radical i suppose um anti-fascist movement or group that is like kind of quite explicitly not doesn't work with the state and they are kind of lumped in with all the conditions apply to all anti-fascists, even if they're agreed by only a section of anti-fascists. And so we're just going to see that even more so. Like there's going to be even more legal obligation for the official organ anti-fascist organisers um, to agree conditions, and then there'll be harsher enforcement of those conditions. Now that is something we need to be aware of. It also should deepen up a practice of, of collective organising of like not kind of putting any one person forward as an a organizer because for one thing i would argue that's not a particularly healthy way to organize in the long run but also it's risks that person to a bunch of fines prosecutions all this kind of stuff for breach for organizing breaches of conditions um i i can't i haven't seen whether the fines will continue uh in this new bill the fines for organizing gatherings i suspect uh I haven't seen, so I can't comment on it, but, you know, there are other kind of legal penalties that are associated with breaking conditions. Um, I remember uh, there was a student, one of the student leaders from ages ago was kind of arrested at one point for one demonstration for organising a breach, a protest that was in breach of conditions. Now, I don't think he got convicted or it got taken anywhere, but the arrest still happened and it will happen more as well. This policing bill relates to... Uh, as you said at the beginning, Alex, um, mass gatherings, protests, um, big things out in the open. Um, there's also been uh, the history of what's called the spy cops bill um, passed, uh, where I think it's called the covert human intelligence sources bill, um, which formalizes a selection of practices that the UK government and UK police have been doing anyway 
for a very long time. <laughs> in fact, they're very explicit about this. It's kind of an astonishing piece of uh, writing on the on the, the website um, discussing this bill, which is that you know we have always been uh, committing crimes and um, blaming other people in movements, and we've always been doing undercover things, and we've always been um, you know um, uh, getting away with uh, things that we that are, would be illegal in other contexts because we are undercover police and so on. Um, now what we're doing, and that all this bill does is simply formalise that process, gives the legal um, right for something that's always happening. However, it's quite a major transformation, uh, and it is important to um, that this thing be uh, uh, criticised as well, uh, not just because of its uh, implications for anti-fascism. I think those are quite substantial, um, given that it also gets it allows people to get away. Um, it would allow an undercover agent working inside an anti-fascist organization to propose and also to um, uh, carry out um, quite extreme illegal actions with that group or even to kind of push that group to carry out those actions um, without any kind of penalty on them. And this is, of course, um, normally known as like entrapment uh, in which people, uh, if you can prove, and this happened, this is quite a a large, quite an this is quite frequently used in uh, the U.S. context, right? Um, particularly, uh, famously, I guess, like in the case of kind of some of the Black Power movements, um, when the people who were pushing for the most radical action, assassinations, and so on, bombings, um, were um, found to be themselves uh, undercover agents. I think there's kind of there's a worrying tendency of this happening uh, also in the U.K. and also um, in the case of anti-fascism. Yeah, and you know we need to acknowledge. Uh... What a lot of those spy groups did was sexual assault and was, you know, kind of rape, um, fathering children with um, activists who, and then disappearing, you know, really quite extreme abuse. And um, this legalizes it, and that's awful. Um, There's another lens we need to see this bill in. Um, And this is, um, we can see this most clearly in the, the, her Majesty's Inspectorate on Emergency Services. I can't remember the full uh, title. Um, but basically, it's the Inspectorate of the Police, of the Fire Service, and things like this. And almost at, in kind of in conjunction with this new bill, there's been a new report into um, a new term, which they've the, a new kind of ca- cl- classification for um, activists, in which antifascists will almost definitely fall into, which is aggravated activists. And this replaces the old term, which was domestic extremists, which Organisations like Netpol, who have, I mean, I've drawn on quite a lot over the years, have campaigned against for a very long time. So this aggravated activist is a new term for uh, domestic extremist. And they define aggravated activist as um, activated, aggravated activism as activity that seeks to bring about political or social change, but does so in a way that involves unlawful behaviour or criminality, has a negative impact upon community tensions or causes an adverse economic impact to businesses. So once again, we see this this idea of impact, economic impact to businesses, which is a lot about what this is, uh, this is about, the fracking movement, um, opposition to uh, arms companies, things like this, uh, would, would, would de- ac- involvement in that kind of activism would designate someone an aggravated activist. Um, and also, just by, by definition, it would include a lot of anti-fascists. Um, in fact, most anti-fascists it would include. Um, so this is something we need to be aware of. Now, the, the aggravated activism designation in the report is kind of um, divided into high level, which the which is the um, preserve of counter-terror uh, organ- um, policing, and then low level activism, which is the preserve of a new kind of intelligence unit, which has been active monitoring XR and BLM protests uh, under the under the uh, under the purview of the National Police Chiefs Council, uh, which is like one of these kind of semi, not semi-legal, but like kind of semi-state bodies which oversee British policing. So there's like College of Policing, all these kind of things that are going on in the, uh, like the kind of the way the Brit police leadership organises itself in this country. Um, but this kind of intelligence unit is, is a kind of replacement for the kind of disgrace unit that Spy Cups came out of. Um, the, the kind of one that produced Mark Kennedy and, you know, all these other other kind of spy cops as well. Just going back to the kind of the question of Black Lives Matter, I think in what happened, um, at least in the, partially in the summer of 2020, when there were um, Black Lives Matter protests all over the US and um, also in the UK as well, is that the UK police, as they have so often done, were managed to frame themselves as the like more liberal alternative to the US police, right? So the UK police and indeed like the UK 
right wing, uh, has often managed to like benefit from just the sheer uh, aggression and violence of the US police. And so there's a kind of a comparison that is often made between these, these two forces. Um, the UK police is this idea of itself as kind of a, a policing by consent and so on. Um, I think that this is farcical. Um, this is uh, not true at all. And the, uh, there's lots of evidence for these, um, for there being actually much greater parity between the UK style of policing and the US style of policing. I think um, I would encourage people to go and check out the the net poll, um, as uh, Alex was just saying, a uh, discussion of um, a report into uh, the policing of Black Lives Matter over the summer of 2020. It's um, really excellent. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other things I wanted to say about this uh, notion of policing by consent, and in particular about the targeting of both BLM and, and XR. And of course, um, targeting BLM activists in particular fits within um, a, a, like a much longer history of policing in the UK. It's very obvious why that would happen. Um, the police are a racist institution, um, and they would uh, they're going to target uh, Black Lives uh, Matter protesters, of course. Um, XR is a much stranger case. Of course, XR are very disruptive, but the actual constituency of people who were involved in XR was significantly older. It was quite a lot whiter than uh, most protest movements are in the UK. And I think what's kind of interesting about this and the particular targeting of exile that's going on in this bill is that it seems to be kind of sapping away at that consensus-driven model. And this is quite a big sacrifice, I think, for the uh, the legitimacy of the police. Although, of course, these activists are kind of identified as kind of lefties and they wouldn't vote for the Conservatives anyway. And so, you know, that's kind of this sense in which, like, you can... Um, target this constituency and it's it's kind of okay but i kind of wonder if there's going to be a transformation amongst those um activists uh, in xr and people like this and um, towards a much harder anti-police politics i mean they are xr are often criticized for their kind of um naivety about um the status of the police in in the uk and i wonder what this might make uh what this might do to kind of uh, activism in the uk uh, as the police are kind of increasingly seen perhaps um possibly over the next few years as these kind of um bill comes into play as increasingly a, a police are seen as kind of antagonist uh, in a much more obvious way that uh, i think people um in kind of anti-fascism and so on would would already see them as but as this this like idea is kind of generalized i, I, I kind of wonder what the dynamics are i'm not quite sure what those dynamics um, will be. I mean, the police have been, uh, specifically the Metropolitan Police, but policing in general, has had a, been involved in, I would say, an ex extended legitimacy crisis for you know a long time. Um, and this has been by their own doing. You know, the constant kind of deaths in police custody that you know has really sadly swelled the ranks of the United Friends and Family campaign, um, who campaign on um, for justice for. Um, for families of, of people killed in custody. Um, the institutional racism of the police, uh, led by the McPherson report, uh, which is about um, failure, police failures in the relation to uh, the investigation of the killing of, racist killing of Stephen Lawrence and the subsequent, you know, kind of revelation, at least in the report, that um, the police are institutionally racist. Like, this has been going on for decades. Um, and the police, this kind of Dixon of Doc Green kind of, friendly Bobby on the beat kind of image of policing is, is very useful, um, but it's very, you know, hasn't been true for since, you know, for, for forever. And th there's only so much, I think there's only so long that image can hold up. Um, of course, there is a danger, and this is kind of bringing it back to this kind of creeping fascism kind of idea, which I have many problems with, but like there is a, like a, a, a constituency in the UK, uh, a large one, uh, who like love it, like love the police and really love the police and love what they do to BLM protesters and uh, racist to BLM protesters and, you know, want more policing and they want the police to do more. Like they think Crested Dick is a soft touch. Um, and that constituency isn't very big. Uh, <laughs> that constituency, you need to edit that bit out. <laughs> It's massive. <laughs> well, I don't know. Like this is, I'm genuinely kind of curious about this. I don't. I think there is a broad conservative coalition in the UK. There's a broad conservative hegemony in the UK and has been for a very long time. I don't think there's necessarily a broad reactionary hegemony. I think those are two distinct ideas. And I think the kind of the pro police, you know, support the police, whatever they do, thin blue line stuff that is very popular in certain quarters. I think is actually quite limited in its appeal. And I think there's actually. Um, 
and I, so I'm guessing I'm kind of wondering, like, to what extent will the police become over the next few years um, a kind of point of real like contention or a point of real kind of like hegemony splitting um, within UK politics? Whereas, you know, of course, like um, they're not going to become that at the level of party politics. Of course, I mean, the leader of the opposition is literally <laughs> is a cop. <laughs> so, who? Keir Starmer. Yeah, I suppose. He's a cop. He was the head of DPP. He's a cop. He's a cop. He's a, okay. he's, he's a fucking cop. <laughs> what do you? How? How is it? Why could he not be a cop? Yeah. So it's not going to happen at the level of party politics, but I think it might happen at the level of a. Um, a, 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 a I don't know. I, the, the, I feel like this is a moment of sp- that, that could possibly engender a moment of splintering. Right. So you get more and more kind of radical um, uh, environmental activism in the UK. And I think this is a really important thing for anti-fascists. I, I mean, I, I'm going to quote this line from our, our, our book. Uh, I don't know if uh, Alex agrees with this. Uh, if anti-fascism wants to be resolutely anti-fascist, then it must address climate change. If environmentalism wants to adequately resolve the crisis of climate change, then it must be anti-fascist. And I think this is this is this is really kind of crucial. I think that Alex is kind of cringing at the, the, the sheer notion that anti-fascism would like you know, generalize. It's like it's like thoughts on the world. But uh, don't know. Um, why are you I, feeling this on me? I wrote. I we cover this book. Like, like, I'm not. I, I if I didn't have a problem with it, it wouldn't be in, no. Unless you're sneaking lines in without telling me. I am sneaking lines in without telling you all the time. <laughs> okay. yeah. And I've been deleting those lines on the on the secret. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the, the. It's a dialectical process, isn't it? It's a dialectical yeah. process. I, I write uh, things and Alex deletes them. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> okay, so um, I think I think you are right to some. Ris- Respects like there is a, there's clearly like increasingly obvious social fracturing when when before it was uh, quite successfully uh, managed quite successfully by the state um, it's less less well managed whether that equates to some kind of very significant turn against the police is another thing like I agree with you to some extent that the reactionary police lovers are quite a small constituency but the you know the people who aggressively don't care who are like aggressively kind of on the fence uh, make up the vast majority of this country and it's you know a lot of the reasons why there's problems in this country and then there's the people who actually interact with the police on a daily basis who genuinely really hate them and you know that's a uh, an increasingly significant constituency as well. Um, not that they were not significant before, but that they they're becoming increasingly like visible. Um, yes, the police have always been, and this is like uh, essentially the same logic as colonialism. There has been there have been areas of the country, particularly white areas of the country, and particularly kind of like um, interactions that people have with the police that are essentially fine. It's the, the the point is that that fineness is conceals the the edge case, right? And the edge case is like increasingly uh, in which the interaction with the police is like violent, uh, aggressive, um, and often like against the law in some kind of measure. Um, and that edge, the point of essentially violent reproduction of, cap- of the capitalist class relation, that that edge at which the police have to violently reproduce the capitalist class relation, that edge is expanding and expanding and expanding, 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 and it's expanding into constituencies who in the past, would have never encountered this kind of thing at all. And this is what's particular about, and this is what's significant about, the fact that this is specifically targeting XR, which are a very white organisation, which are actually quite an old organisation. And like these are not the two constituencies that you would think of as having like, essentially anti-police politics. So I'm thinking the next round of XR politics will probably be much more aggressive. And that's, to be honest, too welcomed. I want to think about the future. Uh, well, I don't want to think about the future <laughs> because it's scary. But let's think about the future, regardless. Um, and I think, I think, so that the, the, the I made the kind of comparison with the UK and the US earlier. But it's also possible to think about this relation to France. So France last year passed a bill um, which was which banned the filming of police officers um, on active duty, and this basically means that the police have no there's no oversight, there's no kind of um, sous surveillance to use the proper French term, which means like surveillance from below. Um, there's none of this. This is not it's not possible for people to kind of citizen journalists and so on to uh, record the police doing blatantly illegal things, which they do in France, perhaps even more than they do in the UK. Um, um, and it's not possible for them to be recorded and, and then prosecuted because of their uh, breach of the breach of the law and the police. That is, that's no longer allowed. Um, so what? Is capital, as in like the bourgeoisie, as in like the government, etc., to kind of uh, <laughs> equate those things momentarily? What are all these three things, these forces of social control? What are they anticipating in the future that this legislation is going to be increasingly useful for? 
Because in some sense, it seems like an overreaction. You know, particularly in the French case, if the kind of the bad apple model of policing, which I think is like very often appealed to, you know, the few bad apples, if that was true, then you would welcome surveillance. You would welcome people um, recording the actions of the police so you can like weed out those bad cops and ultimately end up a kind of a, a better policing system. But it's obviously not true. And they know it's not true. So I'm like, what are they anticipating to happen in the future? That means that they will require this legislation, which seems in some ways like an overreaction to XR, an overreaction to recent French protests, an overreaction to Black Lives Matter and so on. What is, what is the state anticipating? Because this stuff is, this is a massive overreaction to the, to the real forces of social uh, protest, to real forces of protest. The forces of protest are not that substantial. They're not overwhelming in the way that this, these um, laws seem to suggest that they are. So what are they anticipating will happen in the future? I mean, it's how, you're asking about the intent of the, of the, of the laws. And it, it, it's hard to balance that, really, because you have to take into consideration like the kind of, I suppose, the internal politi- politicking that's going on within the police and uh, government. Um, you know, for a long time, the police were, you know, against having new powers. As you mentioned the water, water cannon case. They didn't think they would particularly need it. And that kind of, there has been a change. And I, I don't know whether that change came with Cressida Dick or what happened within that kind of National Police Chiefs Council, ACPO, the, all this kind of stuff. ACPO is the former National Police Chiefs Council. I didn't, shouldn't have included them. Anyway, um, that has engendered this kind of push for new laws. There might not be an anticipation. There might just be, we can get away with this now, and so we're going to get away with it now, um, which, you know, is uh, pretty Patel's really into these laws, and she was really against XR. And it seems like an instigation for them was the XR protest. So, you know, if they make a point in the kind of, uh, kind of admen- addended notes um, to the bill that the XR protest cost the... Metropolitan Police, sixteen million pounds. Um, so the, the XR, XR protests have been used as the, as the justification. Um, now, whether they're expecting mass riots in three years, we don't know. Um, I would anticipate there would be once lockdowns over and there are certain COVID-related restrictions and the pandemic has subsided. You know, there's there's deep kind of deep contradictions, oppressions in this country. That and that have not been resolved, and they're not going to be resolved. Not least the government handling of a pandemic, the government handling of a pandemic, the you know deepening climate crisis, all this kind of stuff is unresolved, and this ir- ir- irresolution is going to create tensions. And it's whether what this bill's trying to do in many ways is um, kind of flatten those tensions out and like only allow you know we people talk about kind of um, you know approved protest in like a ooh, 1984 kind of ah uh, kind of way but you know that ultimately that is kind of the thing like any any pro- all, any effective protest is disruptive and a criminalization of a protest that is disruptive is criminalization of um any possibility of <laughs> any possibility of 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 change things change in society not through kind of deliberation they change through conflict um and there is a, there is a, an, it is an attempt. I see it as an attempt to kind of flatten that conflict out in many ways. Um, anti-fascism as a kind of in, inherently conflictual or conflict-based activism, one that is in conflict with the far right, um, is you know kind of a, a target, uh, like kind of a, a chief area of concern when these laws are, are, are passed. And this kind of flattening out of, of conflict is something we need to be thinking about quite a lot as well. Um, of course, we need to kind of add in that there's a certain anti-fascist actions that are not kind of, it's not really relevant. So anything that you, you know, not announcing, you're not organising like a public demonstration, the kind of clandestine, you know, direct action kind of actions, are they're covered by other laws and they're not particularly, re- it's not really relevant to like kind of organising protests. Um, but of course, we need to, We've been talking a lot about the need for a diversity of types of activism within anti-fascism, which includes, you know, big coalitional kind of movements, um, which very much will be affected. 
It's also important to say that this might well, that, that, that Boris Johnson. I think people will think, think about Pretty Patel a lot, which is absolutely right. I mean, she's definitely is a reactionary. Um, she probably is has like kind of authoritarian instincts for sure. Um, but people also kind of avoid talking about Boris Johnson, but he's actually really important here. Like the, um, you know, as I mentioned before, it was under Boris Johnson's watch as mayor of London that these water cannons were bought. He gives this impression of being this kind of avuncular kind of uh, liberal conservative who's not liberty, he's like a kind of, civil libertarian. Almost. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. Right. Like, and, um, you know, he was, uh, apologetic uh, at, at, with, with the COVID restrictions at, at the very beginning and um, you know kind of for, for good reason because like this in this the COVID restrictions forestalled the accumulation of capital uh, society which is uh, Boris Johnson's um, central goal right like so uh, the um, yeah so, so he gives this kind of chart this kind of molecular charm but actually I think uh, has a, a much stronger law and order um, instinct than he is um, than is every kind of um, apparent uh in public, I want to make a kind of another a point, which is that this these laws will have an effect on the far right's capacity for demonstrations as well. Um, in fact, uh, I'm pretty sure that section uh, 13 of the law, which is much less discussed, um, which is the uh, ability to ban a protest from going to a particular location, a, a ban a procession from going to a particular location, was used against the EDL um, and then when they were banned from entering Tower Hamlets. Um, is that right? Am I getting the my legal? Theresa May as Home Secretary banned. Uh, an EDL protest in 2011. I mean, th this protest has been used 12 times since 2006. I think I read in the Commons Library report, and 10 of those times have been used against the far right. Yeah, right. So it has it will have effect on the far right. This is actually less significant. So this is, um, in some sense, like this is the expansion of the policing of the far right, which is, of course, um, was another thing that happened in the summer of 2020. There were um, kind of DFLA stragglers uh, and um, these kind of groups that had um, a major clash with uh, the police in, in Whitehall. And there, the, this, these laws are also targeted against them as well. I think in the future, this might be less significant. The DFLA is has not returned since it's uh, that um, that clash and um, almost a year ago now. Um, the um, large scale um, organisations like the EDL, who focus almost exclusively on street protests, um, are um, falling apart. I mean, the EDL certainly, um, but I think also there's a shift in the far in far right politics, which we'll talk about more when we talk about patriotic, patriotic alternative in a later episode, away from street-based action and towards electioneering and this kind of thing. Um, how successful they'll be with that is a, is, a, is a really complicated question that we will again answer in a later episode. But I think the, um, I think what's going to, uh, what, uh, this is actually less significant for the contemporary far right than it perhaps um, seems. Okay. So th 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 there's also this other dimension of it, which is that, uh, which I want to talk about as a particular kind of far right phenomena, because I think it really is, um, which is the spread of conspiracies around protests. So when um, Ian Tomlinson uh, was unlawfully killed by the police um, at the G20 protests, there was widespread outrage that he had been killed. There was also people, lots of people who were like, well, you know, he shouldn't be standing there, blah, blah, blah. But no one claimed that Ian Tomlinson was a crisis actor. No one claimed Ian Tomlinson was not real. <laughs> no one claimed like that the entire thing was staged. But that is almost immediately the thing that has been happening um, on uh, large sections of the far right in relation to this vigil that um, happened on on Saturday. Um, immediately, people who the, the women who were arrested at that vigil um, were claimed to have been uh, crisis actors. Um, the police are kind of staging this thing; didn't really happen. And it's not that this is saying, okay, well then the police are actually not. Um, uh, not to blame, and so on. But the, it's kind of a weirder politics in which, like, the question of protest and the question of the police response to protest becomes actually impossible to understand, like, impossible to even frame as a question. How could there be social contestation? How could there be protests um, that contest the social um, whole? Uh, or uh, how, how could there be protests that contest aspects of uh, the social whole um, when everyone and everything is a paid crisis actor? And this is uh, not obviously part of fire politics but it's, it's it's deeply involved in the same kind of conspiratorial um, conspiratorial um, trend of um, fire politics online and I think that's a uh, an interesting and, and strange shift that um, we're going to have to contend with when we think about um, not just the policing of but the broader reception of protest in the future nice <laughs> okay <laughs> thanks for that uh alex <laughs> we are done here i think unless you have any final points um i would my i have some final points uh, go, i would go. say 
a great place to keep up with the bill and how to fight against the bill and fight against the attacks on our freedom to assemble is the Network for Police Monitoring, who have been, you know, long-standing organisations been doing work on this for a long time. You can find them at Netpol on Twitter and netpol.org is their website. They have a petition. It's currently got against, they've got a petition for the freedom to assemble and against this bill. And it's currently got over 100,000 signatories, which is great. It should be a million. <laughs> so if you haven't signed a petition, please it's go. 68 million. If you haven't signed a petition, then you should, you know, sign it um, and share it with your friends to get them to sign it, convince them why we need um, kind of, we need to protect our rights to protest and our rights to assemble. Um, so yeah, follow them, keep up with them. They're doing really good work. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, my name is Sam. That was Alex. Um, we are told for us for what we now have premium episodes over on our Patreon. So if you're interested in hearing more of us, um, then go over and sign up $2 a month. Uh, yeah. And we'll see you there. Um, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 In the eyes of the government, we are the enemy. In a world where there is no government, anarchy rules. This summer, get ready for the most action-packed podcast. We continue fighting because we hate all authority and love freedom, which cannot be given, but must be taken. Such scenes as... This is not a dialogue, a crime called freedom, parties over, and many, many more. For more text and audio material of interest to anarchists, check out resonanceaudiodistro.org. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed that, then you can help support the podcast on Patreon. All the support we get means a lot to us and it really does help us grow this project. So that's patreon.com slash 12 rules for what and you can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Thanks a lot and I will see you very soon. 12 rules for what?